For more than 100 years, the lighthouse on the old head of Kinsale on the southern coast of Ireland had been a welcome sight after an often perilous crossing of the North Atlantic by ocean liner. Today, it marks the nearest landfall to the scene of the most dramatic and controversial maritime disaster of the century. Eighteen kilometers offshore, in waters 100 meters deep, lies the wreck of Lusitania, one of the greatest passenger ships of her time. Her sinking by a German U-boat in the first year of World War I shocked the world. But Lusitania was not merely a casualty of war. She was a victim of the extraordinary rivalry that had brought about her very creation. At the turn of the century, ocean liners were the largest moving objects ever built. Grand expressions of the Industrial Revolution. And like rockets of the space age, the liners had become the ultimate symbol of national prestige. The ships evolved from just being a strictly business venture to being a statement about the particular country. Britain and the new United German nation became embroiled in an extraordinary game of one-upmanship for maritime supremacy. England had always been supreme on the oceans of the world. So to suddenly have an upstart, a place which hadn't even been a country, get together and build four stackers, this was a shock to England, a terrible blow, and they had to do something about it. In 1914, the rivalry between Britain and Germany became war, and the liners were to become giant pawns in an unbridled battle for dominance of the globe. At the beginning of hostilities, the British First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, ordered his navy to blockade Germany. His aim, to starve the enemy into submission. As well as having the world's largest navy at his disposal, Churchill requisitioned scores of ocean liners for war duties. And Winston Churchill, who was First Lord of the Admiralty, was determined that he had this sort of extra fleet at his command, which would be the armed merchant cruisers. The British government had subsidized the two Cunard giants, Mauritania and Lusitania, for precisely this purpose. But the Admiralty overlooked Lusitania and called up the newer Aquitania. Completed only months before the war, Aquitania was designed as a comfortable, luxurious vessel for the transatlantic run. With guns mounted, exteriors painted gray, and splendid interiors stripped bare, Aquitania and Mauritania were transformed into the fastest auxiliary cruisers on the high seas. But almost immediately, Churchill discovered that the giant Cunardas were totally unsuited to the purpose. Well, he made a discovery that his planners hadn't told him that within three weeks, there wasn't a scrap of coal left in the Admiralty bunker. They'd drained all the coal that these ships are very expensive to run. Impractical as auxiliary cruisers, Aquitania and Mauritania were dispatched to other, more appropriate war duties, as troop ships. Almost overnight, the fleet of passenger liners that had linked the British Empire in peace were transformed for trooping duties. Indeed, with their enormous passenger carrying capacity, ocean liners were to prove of great strategic importance in the war against Germany. 
and would help facilitate the spread of the war to a global scale. Hundreds of thousands of eager soldiers from New Zealand, Australia, Canada and South Africa set out on a voyage of a lifetime to the front lines of Europe and North Africa. The potential to move troops around by sea isn't just a function of the great liners. We did it with sail and wood throughout the 19th century. We had from the East India Company on in India and we carried troops to India by the long route to South Africa by the long routes. But steam and metal transformed that with the rapidity with which you could move them and the scale on which you could move them. The first truly ocean-going liner to carry troops was the Great Britain. In the mid-1850s, she was converted to carry 1,650 soldiers and 30 horses to the Crimean War. At the end of the 19th century, Empire troops voyaged from Australia to South Africa to fight in the Boer War. And throughout the 19th century, ocean liners were fundamental to furthering France's new colonial interests in Africa and the Far East. Yeah, this is an interesting drawing of the liner Lafayette. Uh, she was built in 1864, and later in her career, she has been used as a troop uh, transport all over the world with the French troops, and especially the Boxer Rebellion. So this is originally the steerage, which has been transformed to accommodate the soldiers. Here you can see the bunks. On the drawing you can see on the promenade deck we have got 37 mm cannons marking red ink. For some ships you have got two drawings, I should say. You have got one drawing which is for the way out and one for the way back. And unfortunately, on the way back, instead of a dining room, you find an hospital to bring back the diseased people or the wounded, even the dead. During the First World War, hundreds of liners served as hospital ships. Wearing the distinguishing Red Cross colors, a ship could claim protection under the Geneva Convention and, theoretically, become a sanctuary from the carnage. In 1914, the White Star Line launched the Britannic. A sister ship of Titanic, she would be the largest British liner constructed for almost 20 years. But she was never to see passenger service. Britannic was hurriedly converted into a massive hospital ship and, like her sister, would meet an untimely end when sunk by a mine during one of the most ill-fated battles of the war. Britannic served alongside Aquitania and Mauritania and scores of other liners, enabling Britain to launch a second front against Turkey at Gallipoli. In the first six months of the campaign, more than 100,000 wounded received treatment on board one of the 20 hospital ships on duty. The Gallipoli campaign ended in disaster for Britain and in one of the sad ironies of the war, countless troops were to spend their last days alive on some of the world's most luxurious liners. As the war escalated, the British government actively encouraged Cunard to maintain a regular passenger service across the Atlantic. The giant Cunarda Lusitania had so far avoided war duties. Unlike her fleetmates, Mauritania and Aquitania, her cabins and public rooms had not been stripped bare for bunks and war supplies. As long as there were paying passengers, the sound of champagne corks and a palm court orchestra would continue to drown out thoughts of the war. But in 1915, the sea lanes around Britain were the most dangerous in the world.
In retaliation for the British blockade of her shores, Germany had declared the waters around Britain a war zone, and every ship met in this zone would be sunk without warning. The German embassy in New York began to advertise in American newspapers uh, on the side of the Cunard advertises, they wrote that here a warning to all travelers who want to use a ship of Cunard, it, they, their life would be in danger if they do so. Saturday morning in New York. It was May 1st, 1915. Sailing day for Lusitania. D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation was playing on 42nd Street Bloomingdale's was pushing pianolas and the stores were promoting Blue Surge Week for men. Cunard was advertising too. Lusitania, the largest and fastest liner in Atlantic service sails at 10 a.m. Beside it, a warning. Vessels flying the flag of Great Britain are liable to destruction. Travelers do so at their own risk. Imperial German Embassy. Despite the warning, 1,300 passengers arrived at New York's Pier 54 to board the giant Cunada. There were only 12 cancellations. Rumors persisted that the ship was armed and carrying war supplies. The British denied it. So did the New York port collector, who cleared the ship for sale. On board were 159 Americans. As citizens of a neutral country, their presence alone, it was felt, would be the absolute guarantee of safety against any proposed U-boat attack. And of the German threat, Captain Turner, confident his ship could outrun any submarine afloat, said, the best joke I've heard in years. You had that ironic situation, that it looks so naive now, when we think that any shipping company could in 1914 have continued to keep a vessel in service across the hostile North Atlantic when it was a German proclivity to sink anything in sight. Five days later, off the southern coast of Ireland, Lusitania received a radio message warning of submarine activity in the area. U-boat skipper, Lieutenant Walter Schweiger, had found good hunting in the fishing grounds off the Irish coast. In 48 hours, he'd sunk two Harrison Line steamers. At 2 p.m. on the 15th of May, Schweiger spotted an enormous steamer with four funnels and two masts. He gave the order to dive, and give chase. At 3 p.m., the unidentified liner changed course to take a bearing off the old head of Kinsale. In doing so, it offered Schweiger a perfect target. In less than 20 minutes, Lusitania sank 100 meters down to the sandy bottom. The news reached London shortly after 4 p.m., an hour after the attack. Cunard and the London newspapers said details were still coming in, but it appeared all the passengers had been saved. The next morning, a more accurate picture emerged. Of the 1,918 on board, 1,195 perished. The Irish port of Queenstown had known tragedy before. Three years earlier, it was the last port of call for Titanic on her fateful maiden voyage across the Atlantic. Now, townspeople rallied to help Lusitania survivors and deal with the scores of bodies that had washed ashore. 
123 Americans had perished in the disaster, including millionaire sporting identity Alfred Vanderbilt and famous theatrical producer Charles Frohman. The disaster stunned America. President Woodrow Wilson wept when told of the sinking. On Wall Street, hundreds of millions of dollars were wiped off the market. And Washington was abuzz with talk of America joining the war. In Germany, the sinking was applauded. News of the speed at which Lusitania sank and survivors' accounts of a second explosion following the torpedo were used to justify Germany's claim that Lusitania was carrying munitions destined for Britain. I don't think there's any doubt that she was carrying a certain limited amount of, of ammunition, uh, but nothing that would have caused it, the, the huge explosion that did, did occur. After nearly 80 years of controversy, Dr. Robert Ballard, discoverer of the Titanic, led an expedition in 1993 to the wreck of the Lusitania in an attempt to discover the reason for the second explosion. Was Lusitania carrying explosives as the Germans claimed? Or was there another explanation? Rather than contraband, Ballard found evidence to suggest the torpedo hit a near-empty fuel bunker and ignited highly combustible coal dust. So I think Ballard has got it about right and that it was a secondary explosion of a mixture of, uh, of, of coal dust which blew the side out of the ship and that's why she went down so, so, so quickly. Both sides used the incident for propaganda at home and abroad. A medal struck in Germany celebrating the sinking of the so-called blockade runner caused a furor in Britain. The medal was not printed by the German government, but it was here printed by a private man in Munich. And one of these, of course, or several of these, also came to England. And in England, the propaganda was made. They took the medal, reprinted it, and brought it on the people and said, that's the way as Germany reacts on the sinking of the Lusitania. The final moments of Lusitania were reenacted before movie cameras in a duck pond on London's Wimbledon Common. Presented in newsreel cinemas as actual footage of the disaster, the film was designed to fuel international hatred of Germany. Indeed, Winston Churchill seemed to be looking for just such an incident to encourage neutral America into the war. In top-secret correspondence written months earlier, Churchill stressed the importance of attracting neutral shipping to British shores in the hope of embroiling the US in the war with Germany. He stressed Britain's need for the ocean trade. The more the better, he said. But if some of it gets into trouble, better still. Churchill's macabre wish came true, but at the cost of over a thousand innocent lives. For its part, Germany had unwittingly fallen into Churchill's trap and offered the world its first terrible vision of total war. And that, in a sense, set the tone for the world that after a hundred years almost of the Congress of Vienna to the sinking of the Lusitania, that civilians were not safe. Uh, there was no respect for civilian traffic as opposed to uh, naval or war traffic. The Lusitania was one of the first cases of modern total war. A terrible thing, of course. The Lusitania incident dramatically changed United States' attitudes towards Germany. But the American president stepped away from declaring war. Instead, he sent a damning protest to the Kaiser, warning that further incidents would not be tolerated by his government. 
American passenger ships would now sail the Atlantic with guns mounted to fend off any overzealous U-boat captain. But the attacks continued. And every American ship that limped into port holed by torpedoes or wrecked by gunfire further pressured the US president. Finally, on April 6, 1917, after two years of provocation, the United States Congress voted to declare war on Germany. Across America, young men rallied to the call to arms. The American Expeditionary Force would offer a fresh vitality to the exhausted Allied battalions bogged down in the mud and misery of Europe. But how to get them there? The answer? Dozens of German passenger liners tied up in US ports. Indeed, all the German liners were immediately interned at the declaration of war. They were to be transformed from passenger ships to American troop ships. Before they went ashore, some German crews scuttled or sabotaged their ships rather than give their new enemy any advantage. To clear a path for the troopers on the Atlantic, US and British submarine chasers and blimps made an all-out assault on the elusive German U-boats. eastern seaboard of America, bound for France, were shiploads of troops fresh to war and high in morale. Men full of confidence and the we'll soon finish this off kind of spirit. When crowds at a French port cheered the arrival of General Pershing, the American commander-in-chief, the Germans could no longer boast that no American soldier would ever set foot on the soil of Europe. For now the first for setting foot and so were thousands more of his fellow countrymen. Over the coming months, nearly two million soldiers would cross the perilous Atlantic on converted liners. It was the largest seaborne transportation of troops in history, and certainly the most dangerous. By the summer of 1918, American soldiers had joined a massive counter-offensive that would bring an end to the war. In the Argonne, the stars and stripes rose from the ground and the promise behind all that training and build-up of American strength was fulfilled. So then it was British, French, American, Australian, New Zealand, Canadian and South African together sweeping the grey from the field. On the 11th of November, 1918, the battlefields of Europe fell silent for the first time in four years. At war's end, hundreds of overcrowded troopers and hospital ships made for home. The Atlantic crossing of a week or two was bearable. But the two-month voyage to Australia and New Zealand left many wondering if they'd ever reach home at all. Homecomings to New York drew enormous crowds. The ex-German liner Vaterland, renamed the Leviathan, had transported over 110,000 troops to Europe. On one extraordinary crossing, she carried more than 14,000 people, at the time, the greatest number of passengers to travel on a ship ever recorded. In the war to end all wars, the liners had a tremendous impact. Their capacity to move entire armies from continent to continent was instrumental in globalizing the war and shifting the balance of power to the Allies. 
Indeed, the loss of almost their entire fleet of high-speed liners to the Americans had proved disastrous for Germany. Perhaps if Germany hadn't sunk Lusitania and then continued her premeditated slaughter on the high seas, America may have slumbered in neutrality and the war may have had a very different outcome. Instead, the United States emerged as the world's most powerful nation. In 1919, the victors met in Paris to decide on the fate of Germany. Squeeze Germany until the pips squeak. So preached the war leaders. Men like Diaz of Italy, Beatty of Britain, Pershing of America, and Foch of France. With 13 million tons of Allied merchant shipping lost, now was the time to settle the score. The three giants of the Hamburg America line were handed over to their American and British competitors. Having lost 11 liners in the war, Cunard received Imperator and renamed her Berengaria. Leviathan, the ex Vaterland, went into service for the United States line. And the world's largest liner, Bismarck, was taken over by the White Star Line and renamed Majestic. Albert Ballen, the director of the Hamburg America Line, as if foreseeing the inevitable loss of his great fleet, took an overdose of sleeping pills two days before the armistice. With much of Europe devastated by the war, a tidal wave of refugees, many facing political and religious persecution, went in search of a new life elsewhere. Hopeful immigrants took one-way passage on steamers bound for Canada, South America, Australia and New Zealand. But for the overwhelming majority, the destination was America. We left from Hamburg uh, ship's name was Reliance. The name of the ship was the SS Zabland. And I think it was called the uh, Cameronia. In the early post-war years, as many as 30,000 immigrants crossed the Atlantic by liner each week. I remember hordes of people. There were more people on that boat than I thought. There was a, six of us, I'm sorry, seven, six children and my mother were all in one room. We lived in the lowest part of the ship and the whole way down the hold on a three tier, as I remember, three tier high bre uh, beds. In the first two, three days, whoever was on the bottom was out of luck. My mother and my sister and I were seasick all the three weeks we were on that boat. The uh, food uh, was excellent, it was good food. Food was horrible. As, as I know, my mother was a terrific cook. But uh, as far as I was concerned, it was a part of like an adventure. Especially when, during the day when you went up the steps and went out on the deck and looked out and saw that big expanse of ocean. It was impressive. see the skyline, uh, all the people rushed up on deck, but we felt that the ship was going to roll over because all the passengers were on one side of the ship. But it was just fabulous. We were all waiting for the woman to see the Statue of Liberty because that was a sign we are now here. Immigrants traveling in first and second class were processed by officials on board 
and all being in order, disembarked at the shipping line's terminal. But for steerage passengers, the journey was far from over. They were ferried to Ellis Island in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty. With its grandiose architecture, Ellis Island represented a gateway of both hope and fear for the immigrants. Here they would face hours, sometimes even days, of rigorous processing and questioning. There was one large room, we were all in one large room, and I remember, first of all, they took all our clothing and washed it and cleaned it, and we had a chance to shower and clean ourselves, and we had the physical examinations. For all new arrivals, there is a medical examination to weed out those with serious illnesses and dangerous diseases. The real concern was, my mother said, if you go when you come to the, we're coming to the medical department. When you get to the medical department, don't cough or anything like that. And being examined, especially my hair, they were very careful about not letting people in with, uh, with lice. Many immigrants were detained at the island's hospital for weeks and months at a time for observation or treatment the cost of which was borne by the shipping line. Anyone ruled physically or mentally unfit would be handed back to the line for deportation. I was pulled out on a physical and we had to stay an extra night, overnight, I had to be re-examined. And I was just fearful that uh, I would be sent back. To this day I always feel that if it was up to that I would have gone back, my family would have stayed here. And, uh, that was my fear. I was, I was 11 years old. People turned away and walking away crying bitter tears, but that obviously didn't help them because they walked away with an officer with them. And we were allowed to go through this door and they had to go through that door. More than 100 million people today can trace their ancestry to that first often fearful step onto American soil at Ellis Island. And before that, an often unforgettable passage by ocean liner. In earlier years, up until the early 20s, 18 million people came across the Atlantic, all of them by sea, and most of them stopping at Ellis Island as part of the great process. It was the greatest movement the world has ever seen of people from one continent to another, from the old world to the new. You know, the creation of the American dream. And without the, without the big superliners, there wouldn't have been any American dream. Uh, I don't think I'll ever forget it, because that was one of the most important aspects of my life, being aboard ship and knowing my destination. We look forward to be, being Americans. Among the lucky people, I was one of the luckiest. Freedom. Opportunity, freedom, which encompasses every possible definition of that word. I reflect upon it all the time because to us it was a matter of life or death because all my mother's family and there must have been over a hundred people in that small town they all perished and we lived because of that journey. According to F. Scott Fitzgerald, by the 1920s all gods were dead, all wars were fought, and all faiths shaken. The post-war world was going to be different, and how. But front row center on the American political stage, two new laws that threatened the future for the big transatlantic liners. A bill, called the Emergency Quota Act, finally pulled down the curtain on unrestricted immigration to the United States and prohibition, outlawing the manufacture and sale of alcohol across the country. And that meant American liners could not offer one of the most wonderful aspects of an ocean voyage, 
the long bars, you know, that little nip in the morning and the little nip after lunch and the brandies and all that kind of stuff. So the foreign lines really were able to capitalize on this. To break the alcohol embargo, some American lines registered their ships elsewhere and capitalized on thirsty Americans by offering them booze cruises to nowhere. Then a number of enterprising passenger agents came up with a novel idea at the same time. Tourism. Aimed at middle-class Americans, particularly the smart set, smaller ships would set sail to some exotic destination and back for no more important purpose than having a good time. Until the 1920s, there was no better place to see the class system at work than on an ocean liner. But now the age of mass tourism was here and ship life became a democracy of romance and pleasure where no one was better than anyone else. And the grand experiment would have a revolutionary outcome. The one-class ship. According to a New York Times critic, the new trend spelled the end of the class system on the high seas. It was an overreaction. But even the large and conservative British lines, Cunard and White Star, were forced by economic necessity to move with the times. The dramatic drop in immigration to America saw steerage and third-class quarters drop from most ships and improve to tourist class or tourist cabin. Cheap tickets to Europe attracted a growing number of ordinary middle-class Americans, teachers, students and office workers. For some, it was a chance to visit the historic sites of the old world. For others, the nightlife they'd heard so much about from the doughboys when on leave in Paris. Despite the growth in tourism, many of the superliners were still far less profitable than in the days of mass immigration to America. Built pre-war, they were now becoming expensive to run and maintain. All the lines operating on the North Atlantic were forced to rethink their strategy. Both White Star and Cunard decided to rebuild their fleets with more modest-sized ships. At 20,000 rather than 60,000 tons, they would be easier to fill and far more economic to run. The German lines were also rebuilding their fleets with smaller vessels. With ships like the 20,000 ton Albert Ballon, Hamburg America was on its way to becoming the largest and most profitable line of the decade. But just as the days of the large high-speed luxury liner appeared to be numbered, in 1927, the French line launched a stunning new flagship, the Ile de France. At over 43,000 tons, she was the largest ship built since the war. The Ile de France was to bring a new era for the superliner. Not with her size or speed, but for her revolutionary interior design. Her designers had created a modern, sumptuous and uniquely ocean liner style that would take the world by storm. Decoratively, prior to the First World War, the liners were copying landside establishments. Manor houses, castles, even Moorish, Arabian, Egyptian concoctions. And then suddenly, in 1927, comes a liner that breaks away from it completely. The beginning of Art Deco on the high seas.
In the coming decade, the Ile de France would carry more first-class passengers than any ship afloat. It was Americans who particularly fell under her spell, from movie stars to intellectuals. And a new breed of class-conscious American businessmen cashed in their stocks for a first-class ticket to France, just to be seen in the presence of Europe's social elite. It was like walking into the fanciest hotel you'd ever been in your life. I can remember coming on deck and seeing as far as the eye could see on this boat deck. All the ship's stewards lined out there with their little pillboxes hats on, their red and blue jackets, standing inspection like they were the Royal Marines. And they had to pass that inspection. Anybody didn't have his hair cut, his gloves were dirty, his pants weren't creased, or there wasn't a shine on his shoes, he was immediately sent down below. The Ile de France was a floating showcase of the best of everything French. A boulevard at sea, a destination in itself. In John Brennan's classic, The Sway of the Grand Saloon, the author wrote, in those years to come, evenings on the Ile de France may be remembered for everything and anything, except that they were spent in the middle of the ocean. The ocean was as incidental as the street that runs by a hotel. The ship, as a place, had become a reality. But in the late 1920s, an ocean voyage was fast becoming a luxury in which fewer and fewer people could indulge. The economic recession, which would soon turn to depression with the Wall Street crash, threatened, as never before, the future of passenger lines. But a new wave of nationalism was sweeping across Europe. And like the heady pre-war days, rival nations still coveted the prestige of owning one of the world's finest ocean liners as a symbol of their maritime might. In 1928, Edna Mussolini, the daughter of the Italian dictator, launched the largest Italian liner built to date. At more than 32,000 tons, the Augustus was the largest diesel-powered liner of her time. Then, in 1929, it was Germany that sparked a new superliner race with two 50,000-ton giants, Bremen and Europa. They were intended to be, from the very beginning, uh, the greatest ships in the world. They introduced streamlining to ocean liners. And the superstructure forward was streamlined, it was rounded. Instead of great tall thin stacks like on old vessels, uh, they had very low, 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 low stacks, stacks which were much too low. They had to be raised later on. Both Bremen and Europa slashed days off Mauritania's transatlantic record set two decades earlier. No longer humbled by war, Germany was back in the superliner business and Britain had lost, yet again, the blue ribbon to her greatest maritime rival. But the British, in the shape of Cunard, would not give up the race. In the late 20s, they approached Glasgow shipbuilders John Brown to design two express liners for a new weekly service from Southampton to New York. The, the chairman at that time was adamant that there was no notion of building either the biggest ship or the fastest ship. All he wanted was a ship that would satisfy this, this requirement for a two-ship service. Despite Cunard's brief, the shipbuilders soon realized that to achieve a weekly schedule with only two vessels, the liners would need to be bigger and faster than ever before. These liners would need to be giants. In late December 1930, construction began on the first of the yet unnamed vessels. 
Hull 534, as she was known, captured the imagination of the British people. At 80,000 tonnes, she was to be the largest ship ever built and certainly the fastest. But at the same time, across the English Channel, the French were building a liner of almost the same size and potential speed, Normandy. She would hopefully follow in the wake of the stunning success of Ile de France. The French and the British were now locked in an extraordinary race to be the first to challenge their German rivals for the blue ribbon of the Atlantic. Twelve months later, the worsening economic situation in Britain forced Cunard to halt construction of their ship. Over three and a half thousand men were laid off, and Hull 534, 80% complete, was left to rust. Britain was out of the race. Italian shipping lines were also facing ruin. But in 1932, Mussolini stepped in and forced the merger of his country's three largest lines to form the megalithic Italia Line. Within the first year, Italia would launch two brilliant superliners into transatlantic service. The first, the 50,000 ton Rex. She was a greyhound. Her designers far more concerned about mechanics than luxurious interiors. Averaging 28 knots across the Atlantic, Rex beat her German competitor's best time to New York by almost four hours. And became the first Italian liner to win the coveted blue ribbon of the Atlantic. Her running mate, Comte de Savoie, was fast, but not a record breaker. She became renowned for her stabilizing equipment, an attempt to combat the eternal problem of seasickness. Then, in late October 1932, the French delivered to an expectant world their most dazzling creation, Normandy. Rather than her stalled Cunard competitor, Normandy would acquire the mantle as the first 80,000 ton liner. And at over 1,000 feet in length, the longest ever constructed. Underwritten by the French government, Normandy was designed to impress upon the world that France was recovering from the tough economic times. But Normandy was far more than a show pony. She was to influence ocean liner design for decades to come. Her dramatic, clipper-like bow and clean, sweeping superstructure left her contemporaries looking staid and cluttered by comparison. He's quintessentially, I think, the ocean liner. She was fast, she was smart, she was chic, her interiors were extraordinary, the best that French art and artists could devise. And she was just exquisite. that it was sophisticated and elegant and uh, just dreamlike almost in a way. Uh, I think a lot of ship enthusiasts would agree that that perhaps might have been the most beautiful ship inside and out. It was truly the ship of state. They, you can see that it was just more than uh, trying to build a nice ship for, for passengers. This was, this was France, and uh, they were proud of it, and, well, they should have been proud of it. The 
Then, in 1934, after two lost years, the British government forced the merger of Cunard and White Star and provided much needed finance for work to begin again on Hull 534. Just look at the giant 534 and see some of the things that make her the wondership of the age. She represents the supreme triumph of marine architecture and engineering. The Houses of Parliament will be completely hidden were it possible to put this monster liner in front of them. Uh, the interest was fantastic. They talk about her, you know, there was some sort of miracle, the coming of the Lord or something like that. Because it was a sort of a sign of the end of the Depression. In less than six months, an army of workers brought back to life the greatest British engineering triumph of its time. A triumph whose name would become synonymous forever with ocean travel. I am happy to name this ship the Queen Mary. At the time of her launch, the Queen Mary was at least a year behind her French rival, Normandy. Already the German and Italian ships had left Britain in their wake, and no one had any doubt France had its sights on the blue ribbon of the Atlantic. When the Queen Mary took to the water, no British ship in history seemed so important to reviving the nation's prestige. A duel was about to begin a duel between the two biggest ships the world had ever seen. <laughs> 